have the pleasure of speaking tonight on probably my favorite uh, subtopic within the realm of toxicology. So tonight we're going to be talking about toxic creatures, specifically things that bite and sting. Um, so for this, um, just as a, a to preempt it a, a bit, we are going to be focused on more land and uh, yeah, land-based things um, rather than marine envenomations. Marine envenomations is a whole nother beast. Um, but as a primer, uh, I will actually be speaking about marine envenomations in a subsequent mini med school course. Um, uh, it's going to be wilderness medicine. I think coming up in May. Um, so if you like the land-based stuff, you might like the marine stuff, so just plug in the course. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just uh, get right into it. I have, unfortunately, no financial disclosures. Um, and uh, so for our objectives today, we're going to learn about creatures that envenomate, so bite and sting. Um, and just as a principle to this, uh, envenomation does require a toxin. So we're not just talking about the mechanical trauma of a bite or a sting. We're actually talking about a poison. Uh, so with that, we're going to break it down into a couple groups. We're going to talk about some snakes. So of the snakes, we're going to talk about the crotalids or the pit vipers. We're going to talk about the elapids, um, which are like cobras, um, and the arthropods. So arthropods are like insects. So we're going to cover spiders and scorpions. So for each of these topics, uh, let's talk about the clinical presentation. So what a human body looks like after it gets uh, bit or stung by any of these things. And then let's talk about all the uh, potential treatment modalities. So what can we do about it? Of these, uh, we are going to focus on species native to the U.S. Um, there are a lot of poisonous things out there. Uh, from my reading, I believe Australia must be the most poisonous place on the planet. Um, but for us, uh, because there's so many things to talk about, let's just focus on the things uh, in the U.S. and particularly the Americas. Um, this is a really, really big topic. So we're just going to try to have an overview and get some basic concepts down with a few great examples. So let's get into it. The first part, let's talk about some snakes. Um, I personally find them to be beautiful. Uh, that being said, I don't want to be near one. Um, they have some great examples uh, here at the California Academy, uh, right in Golden Gate Park, if you ever get a chance. They have eastern and western diamondbacks. They have a few cobras. Um, and they, they rotate out every now and again, but their diamondbacks are always there. Um, so if you want to see them up close and personal, it's not too far from here. So. Uh, Overall with snakes, let's just talk about the epidemiology and classification. So for the U.S. Uh, Poison Control Center, over 8,000 bites are reported every year. That's a lot. A lot of snake bites happen. The good news is that with those large number of snake bites, less than 10 deaths occur every year. So that, I think, speaks to our effective treatment modalities that we have for the various different snake bites. 99% uh, of these bites, and this is speaking for the United States, all come from the family Verapidae and the subfamily uh, of the crotalids. So we're talking about mostly rattlesnakes here. So the crotalids um, are also known as pit vipers or New World vipers. And these are venomous species um, that are not endemic to Maine, Alaska, or Hawaii. Note that the state that we are currently in, and presumably most of us live in, uh, is not on that list. Um, so we do have the rattlesnakes here in California. Um, and bites have been reported in every state except for Hawaii. Uh, this is mostly because there are a lot of exotic snake collectors out there. Uh, I did my fellowship in New York City, and we had snake bites all the time. And there is no large collection of pit vipers in Manhattan. Uh, it's just individual collectors that like to hold on to venomous snakes. I do not know why. So the majority of the bites happen in the summer months, as you can imagine. So we're coming up on, on peak season, so April through September. It peaks in July. And we pretty much think that this is just because there are more people outside. And for most of the country, you wait till the summer months to go camping and hiking. And you increase your risk of exposure to something that lives outside if you're going to be outside. Characteristically, snake bite victims, 75% of them are men. And it's usually on an extremity. And this is more anecdotal, but of cases that we hear about at poison control centers, it's usually a combination of a young man plus alcohol um, and a desire to show off to friends that they can go pick up a snake that they found. Uh, this is generally not a good idea. Uh, the other people that get bit, a lot of times, it's 10 to 15 percent of victims are children. And a lot of times, these are um, a toddler age children who can walk and they're outside. They either don't notice the snake is there or they're approaching something they don't really know what it is and they have no reason to be afraid of it yet. Um, after they get bit, then they learn. 
Over 50% of the bites are when a victim is purposefully handling a known venomous snake. So these are those exotic snake collectors out there. So just looking uh, at the numbers, you and the audience can decrease your risk of getting a venomous snake bite by just not willingly handling a venomous snake. So I think we're in a good place already. All right, so that, those are the overall numbers. So let's talk about some specifics. So the crotalids, or the pit vipers. So they're called pit vipers, do so they live in pits? They do not. Uh, they live mostly in desert areas. Um, they like the dryness. <clears throat> Uh, but the name actually derives from a pit-like depression behind the nostril. So you can see that right here. So up here is the nostril, back here is the pit. Um, so pit vipers have generally a poor sense of vision. So these uh, pits that they have, are, it's actually a heat sensing organ used to detect prey. Um, so the native crotalids that we have are the rattlesnakes, uh, the, the genus Crotalus and Cistrurus. And we also have the cotton mouths and the copperheads, and they have fallen into the genus Achistodon. And there are other ways to identify pit vipers. Um, first, we have a triangular shaped head, so you can kind of imagine a triangle here. And they have vertically elliptical pupils, and they also have front, paired, and mobile fangs. And what this allows them to do, they actually retract their fangs like a hinge into the roof of their mouth. And when they strike, the hinge comes open and they're able to strike a victim. And these rattlesnake fangs grow up to about three to four centimeters long. Uh, they are terrifying when you see them up close. And I'll give you an example. So here, we can see these front, and so this is where it works on a hinge and kind of goes back into the mouth. Um, and here you can see a great example of the vertically elliptical pupils. So these are just a couple other ways to identify uh, when you're dealing with a crotalus or a pit viper. And just a word of warning, safety reminder, if you're too close to see, the, close enough to see the pupils, you are in fact too close to the snake, uh, step away. Uh, it's not a good idea if you're on a hiking trail and you see a snake with maybe a rattle on it to go up close and try to identify it, just walk away. So the crotalids, what about the rattle? Not all rattlesnakes have rattles, so you can't just rely on that to identify them. Uh, it really depends on the maturity of the snake and where they are in their molting. Um, so if you can see a juvenile rattlesnake, they might not have a rattle. And on top of that, copperheads and cottonmouths don't have any rattles to begin with. But because they're in the same family of snakes, they frequently do shake their tails as if they did have a rattle. I think they're kind of jealous. Um, so. Just another way to try to identify. And since we're talking about them, just so you can see what they look like, this is the cotton mouth. It's also known as the water moccasin. Uh, so it's in the, the genus Echistrodon. <clears throat> and it gets its name uh, quite accurately from when it opens its mouth, it has that bright white color to it. So it's called the cotton mouth. It's also known as the water moccasin because it does live a semi-aquatic lifestyle. It likes to swim, which again is terrifying to me. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the only one in this uh, family that lives a semi-aquatic life. And this is the other one that we had mentioned, the copperhead. Uh, this is a particularly beautiful snake. So you can tell by its color going around, it does have kind of a beautiful copper color. And on the top of its head, that color really comes out. So it gets its name, the copperhead. And again, it's in the, the genus Echistrodon. So let's get into the fun stuff. Crotalid bites. Uh, of the bites that we hear about at poison centers, about half of them come from rattlesnakes, and the other half come from some combination of the copperheads and the cottonmouths. For rattlesnake bites, they do occur throughout the United States, but they're far more common in the southern and western states. Copperheads and cottonmouths, however, uh, again occur everywhere, but are really common in the eastern and southeastern US, that's just where they're native to. And 25% of these rattlesnake bites are considered dry. So that means they struck a victim, but they didn't inject any of their venom. Um, so most of those are just defensive or warning shots to get away from the snake, um, but they didn't want to waste any of their venom on you, presuming that you're going to run away. As a general rule for US pit vipers regarding their toxicity, the rattlesnakes are by far the most venomous followed by the cottonmouths, and then the copperheads. All of them, you don't want to get bitten by, but a bite from a rattlesnake is generally far more severe than a bite from a copperhead. And this is just another example of a terrifying rattlesnake. Um, here's a cottonmouth, and there's another copperhead. 
Okay, so what does it actually look like? As far as a clinical presentation, in general, they're characterized by local swelling and tissue breakdown. Usually you can see one to two distinct puncture sites uh, for, on a victim, but the effects of a bite can range from benign, so those dry bites that we had mentioned, to life-threatening, or we had talked about, the, we do have a few deaths that occur every year. So this is an example of a dry bite. <clears throat> so you can see two puncture wounds in the leg, but there's really nothing else going on around it. There's no redness, it's not particularly swollen. So you have the uh, signs that the bite occurred, but no venom was injected. It gets worse. So people generally develop swelling, or what we call edema, uh, and pain within minutes. However, that swelling can be delayed eight to 10 hours after the bite. So just because you don't see swelling right away doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. You also see bruising, uh, or it's called ecchymosis, redness or erythema. And then you can develop these hemorrhagic blisters. Uh, so we call them blebs or bulli. So we have a couple more examples here. So this is where the bite occurred on the hand. And you can tell the hand is pretty swollen here. And this will come up later in, in as far as treatment. But you can see these sort of pen markings here. So this is one of the things that we do in a hospital. We'll watch the progression of swelling and we'll mark the leading edge of the swelling and timestamp it so we can see how fast uh, the symptoms are progressing. And over here on the right is an example of these hemorrhagic bulli. So these are large blisters that form after a bite and they're all just filled with blood. The rattlesnakes are particularly notorious uh, for having hematologic effects as well, so effects on your blood. Um, about a third to a half of rattlesnake envenomations will develop a coagulopathy or a bleeding disorder. Classically, you get a decrease in your platelet count, which is called thrombocytopenia, and decreased fibrinogen levels. These things together lead to bleeding and an inability to clot normally. On top of that, you can also get systemic effects. These are less common than the local and hematologic effects, but you can get symptoms like nausea, vomiting. A lot of patients will describe a metallic taste in their mouth, and they also complain of generalized weakness and restlessness and anxiety. I admit I would probably be pretty anxious too if I was just bitten by a rattlesnake, uh, but these are the common systemic symptoms that people have. And on top of that, a lot of people are just allergic to the venom itself. So it's not an effect of the venom, but it's your body's immune response to having the venom there. So people can come in with anaphylaxis, so kind of the most severe presentation of an allergic reaction, and we treat these patients just like a peanut allergy. Uh, if we see anaphylaxis, we use epinephrine, and we can give an EpiPen. And I don't know if anybody in the room has themselves or family members who have a severe anaphylactic reaction to things, but most it's fairly common for people to carry an EpiPen with them at all times. Um, a lot of these patients who are allergic generally are snake handlers, um, a lot of zookeepers, things like that, because you have to have a sensitization to the venom. So these are people who get bitten multiple times over the course of their life and then can mount an anaphylactic or severe allergic reaction to it. <clears throat> but it's just another thing that can happen. They can also have neurologic effects, so effects on your brain. It's not common with most rattlesnakes, but there's one in particular that is notorious for this, and that's the Mojave rattlesnake. Um, it, people who get envenomated by the Mojave generally will develop muscle weakness and what we determine as cranial nerve dysfunction, so all the nerves that come off your brain generally go to your face area. Uh, so they complain of things like difficulty swallowing, they can't tolerate their saliva anymore, um, they can have droopy eyelids or complain of double vision. That happens, and if the neurotoxin spreads far enough, it can actually go to your diaphragm and cause respiratory paralysis. And this is how people with uh, Mojave state, uh, bites end up dying. So management, that's, that's the key. So I'm gonna divide it up into pre-hospital care and in-hospital care, because there's a lot of stuff out there uh, talking about what to do when you get bit by a, a snake. It's like hearing stories about what to do if somebody gets stung by a jellyfish, like go pee on it, and that's not true in most cases. So there's a lot of misinformation. Uh, but as far as pre-hospital care, there's been a lot of things studied over the last several decades, and there's really no first aid or field treatment that's been proven beneficial. A lot of things have been tried, nothing seems to help very much, and a lot of things seem to cause more harm. What we generally recommend from the Poison Control Center is to immobilize the affected limb, 
So try to keep, you know, if it's an arm or a leg, as still and straight as possible. Uh, the idea being, if you're moving it around a lot, you're increasing venous and lymphatic flow back to the heart. Uh, so just try to keep the extremity immobilized, and then just get to a hospital as fast as you can. Sometimes this is really difficult if you're out in the bush or if you're on a, a, a camping expedition. But if you can, just get back to a hospital as soon as possible. Things that have been studied that have proven to be detrimental or causing harm include tourniquets, incision and suction, and venom extractors. Uh, all of these things definitely have no benefit, and most studies show harm. So uh, the picture here is just an example of uh, you can go to a lot of outdoors uh, stores or online and purchase things for camping trips and things like that. Um, this is a commercially prepared venom extractor. Um, it does not provide any benefit. They sell them still, uh, but there's no evidence to show that they're going to help you at all. So that's pre-hospital. What do we do in the hospital? As you've heard through most of this course, most of the time we say things like supportive care. So that term gets thrown around a lot, but it really is the cornerstone of all toxicology management. So we focus on airway, breathing, circulation. So whatever's going wrong, we do our best to support that. And like we talked about with that respiratory paralysis and people can't breathe, we'll perform an endotracheal intubation if necessary. So that's just a plastic tube that goes into the mouth and down to the lungs, and we put you on a ventilator. And if you can't breathe, we'll breathe for you. In addition to that, most patients just get observed. Uh, that's the biggest thing. So we monitor for suspected dry bites, and we, but we watch them for at least 10 to 12 hours. Because as we discussed before, you can have delayed symptoms. So if you don't get symptoms until 10 hours later, it wouldn't be good if we discharge you from the emergency room, you go home, and in the middle of the night, you all of a sudden stop breathing. So we'd like to watch you for a while. <clears throat> and like the picture showed before, we mark the leading edge of the swelling, and we continue to monitor. And we also get some blood tests. We're testing for that coagulopathy that we talked about. Luckily, we do have an antivenom. So it's called the Crotalidae Polyvalent Immune Fab. It goes by the trade name of Crofab. They're currently the only people who make it. Um, so it is on patent. <clears throat> it is an ovine or pig-derived antivenom. And it's developed from common North American pit vipers. So what they did is they gathered venom from the Eastern Diamondback, the Western Diamondback, the Mojave, and the Cottonmouth, inject it into a pig, and then we get the antibodies to create the antivenom from those pigs. So this is what it looks like in the vial. Um, and here's how we use it. So this is, an, again, another picture. So this was a foot bite. Um, and you can see these pen markings where they were watching the progression of the swelling. So the antivenom is indicated for progressive swelling, low platelets or the coagulopathy that we had discussed, neurotoxicity. And then the packaging uh, insert for the medication also says any significant systemic symptoms. So it leaves it pretty wide open for the clinician to decide, are they sick or not? And if they're sick, we can use the antivenom. Uh, it, it can halt the progression of symptoms. And that's kind of how we use it. If you have progressive swelling, we'll give you the antivenom, and we keep dosing it until that swelling stops. So it, it, watching your symptoms is how we monitor how much antivenom to give. It does not, however, pre prevent skin necrosis. So once this swelling and bruising and the hemorrhagic bullae start, there, you are at risk of having that skin die. Uh, the antivenom doesn't prevent that from happening, but the idea is we can lose some skin, but you won't die from, from the envenomation. OK, so those were the rattlesnakes and the crotalids. So we're going to switch gears a little bit, talk about the elapids. So the elapids across the world cause a lot of problems because in this family of Elapidae it are the cobras. Uh, so in especially the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia, they cause a lot of morbidity and mortality. Luckily, we don't have cobras here in the United States, um, except for exotic snake collectors. But what we find here that are native are the coral snakes. So they're fairly easy to identify because of their bright color pattern. So they have red, yellow, and black bands. But they're often confused with a non-venomous king snake. So the king snake is a mimicker. So it looks like a coral snake to prevent other predators from trying to eat it, but it's not. So on your left here is a coral snake. And on your right is a king snake. You can see how a bird from above might get confused. Uh, how you tell them apart. Somebody came up with this. I don't know who to credit. But red on yellow, kill a fellow. Red on black, venom lack. Or some people say, red on black, friend of Jack. 
uh, however you want to rhyme it, but the red on yellow is the part you should remember and stay away from. So going back, you can see on the coral snake, you have the red band abutting the yellow band. And on the king snake, the red band goes up against the black band. And that's how you tell them apart. As far as the range of US coral snakes, on your left here, this is the territory for the Sonoran coral snake. And this area overlying Texas is so adequately named the Texas coral snake. And this whole blue or teal area on the east coast is for the eastern coral snake. They're not very clever in the naming system. For the coral snakes, they have front fixed fangs. So their fangs are fixed unlike the rattlesnakes we discussed earlier that have a hinge mechanism. And their fangs are comparatively small. So unfortunately what this means is when they do strike, they tend to latch on and chew for a while. Um, that's how they get their venom into you. So there are case reports of people presenting to emergency departments with snakes still attached to an arm, because uh, a snake won't let go, and if you're in that state of shock, you don't know how to get the thing off. The eastern coral snake is responsible for the overwhelming majority of the morbidity and mortality associated with coral snake bites. The Texas coral snake seems to be less dangerous, but we still have case reports of, of people having uh, severe symptoms. And there's almost no literature supporting the Sonoran coral snake as causing any sort of severe symptoms at all. So of the three, the Sonoran seems to be the safest, and that's the closest one to us. So that's good news. The coral snake toxicity. Here's more good news. Only about 40% of the bites cause any form of envenomation. So you have the mechanical trauma of where they bit you, but it doesn't cause an envenomation syndrome. So that means 60% of coral snake bites are dry bites, which is great. And it's due to the small fangs, you might not actually see any puncture wounds. So classically, with a coral snake bite, the local effects are really minimal. You don't see those two distinct puncture wounds like we saw with the rattlesnake bites. However, their envenomation is not great, and it is characterized by neurotoxicity. So what symptoms people develop are paresthesias, or tingling, uh, slurred speech, double vision, muscle weakness, muscle twitching, and this eventually leads to paralysis and sometimes death. What do we do about it? So this person's handling a coral snake, which I wouldn't recommend. Uh, but the pre-hospital care is the same as for the crotalids. Just try to immobilize the limb and get to a hospital. And in a hospital, what do we do? Again, supportive care. We observe these victims for at least 24 hours. Again, this is because there is an incidence of delayed onset symptoms. Uh, as far as I've seen, uh, the most delayed case uh, that was reported was 20 hours after the bite. Uh, they developed the, the neurologic symptoms. And again, supportive care, intubation as necessary. We do also have an antivenom for this, sort of. So it's called the North American Coral Snake Antivenom, or NASA. <clears throat> it's an equine or horse-derived antivenom uh, from the eastern coral snake, so the most dangerous one. That's how they develop the, the antivenom. Here's the problem, though. So it used to be made by Wythe. Wythe got bought by Pfizer. They're the sole producer, and they decided they're not going to manufacture it anymore. So we don't really have it. Um, it's out there. It's FDA approved. Uh, but there is some stock still available, but it's getting increasingly, as you can imagine, hard to find. Um, where we got it when I was a fellow in New York was the Bronx Zoo. They managed to hold on to some, and whenever I got a snake bite out in Long Island, we'd go up to the zoo, grab a bunch, and head out to a hospital. Uh, but it's getting harder and harder to find. A new antivenom is being studied in Florida. Uh, however, it's still being studied, so it's not yet approved, and it's not yet available for, for the general populace. Uh, and the question was, uh, is there just not enough uh, snake bites out there to make uh, manufacturing this product profitable? And that is the thought, yes. All right, moving on to the spiders. Um, I have a confession for you. I love studying them, but I find spiders to be one of some of the most terrifying creatures on the planet. Um, I hate them, even like the little daddy long legs in a house. I, they just freak me out. But so these pictures, um, it's causing some PTSD for me, but we're going to get through it. We're going we're gonna to talk. We're going to learn. So the spiders in general, about 12 to 15,000 exposures reported to US poison centers annually. Um, but very, very few fatalities ever reported. Um, the hard part about those numbers, and these are just numbers that we get from poison center data of people saying, hey, I got bit by a, uh, by a spider. But these spider bites are really, really hard to confirm. 
it's estimated that about 80% of these reported spider bites are from something else. And these are mites, ticks, ants, bees, and sometimes it's just you have a skin infection and you came into the hospital saying, I don't know, it must have been a spider bite. Um, the spiders get blamed for a lot of things that they're not responsible for. Um, because it's the easiest thing to sort of, if you wake up and you have a little red bump on your leg, eh, must have been a spider. Uh, so most of these numbers are probably not actually spiders, but that's what they get attributed to at least. All right, let's get into some specifics. Who knows what this one is? All right, we're starting easy, okay. Um, so this is a black widow, black widow spider. So the, the scientific name for it is a Latrodectus mactans. Um, it's found in every state except for Alaska. So we have them here in California. Uh, Mactans, interestingly, in Latin means murderer, so we have a very affectionate name for the spider. Um, it's shiny, it's jet black, it's really pretty. Again, they actually have one of these at the California Academy if you want to go look at the, the spider up in person. The female is larger, gets to about 8 to 10 millimeters, a centimeter or so. The male is smaller, um, and lucky for us, uh, because it's smaller size, its fangs are actually too short to envenomate humans. So every time a human gets sick from black widow, it is a female. Um, they have a rounded abdomen and classically a red hourglass marking on the belly. So that's the hourglass, if you can imagine that. Then on the previous slide, I think is a better example of the hourglass on the, on the belly. So the venom. It is on a volume per volume basis more potent than the pit viper venom. The venom contains a lot of different toxins. It's kind of a stew of different poisons. But the most well-described one is alpha latrotoxin. Um, and what it does is it causes a massive release of neurotransmitters, specifically epinephrine or adrenaline and norepinephrine. Uh, and it leads to a syndrome that we term latrodectism. We'll talk about the different components that make up latrodectism. So the clinical presentation, the local effects from the bite. Generally, you can see a small puncture wound at the bite site, and it's often associated with what's called a halo effect. So here's an image. So in the center is where the bite occurred, and you have some redness right at the bite site, followed by a ring of clearing, followed by more redness. This is also classic in, in tick bites, um, but for spider bites, it's more classically associated with a black widow envenomation. And these local effects can progress to more severe and systemic symptoms. Specifically, it causes what's called a myopathic syndrome. And this is the onset of muscle cramping and pain, usually starting between 15 minutes and one hour after you're bitten. It starts at the bite site and then starts to spread. A lot of literature is about um, how black widow spider bites look in the hospital. And a lot of times, especially children, they get confused with having appendicitis because they get such terrible abdominal pain and rigidity that it, it looks to physicians and surgeons as if it's a child with appendicitis. So there's a lot of cases of kids getting taken to the operating room to take their appendix out, but as soon as they get in there, the appendix looks totally normal, and then on further history, they see a bite mark, and they figure out it was a black widow. So it causes the severe abdominal and chest wall pain and these symptoms can persist for several days if they're not treated. And the other systemic symptoms from a black widow causes nausea, vomiting, sweating, elevated heart rate and blood pressure, and one of my favorite terms in medicine, uh, the pavimortis. It's a fear of death or this feeling of impending doom, uh, so it doesn't sound like fun. And in rare cases, acute myocardial infarction, so heart attack, um, and there are cases reported of priapism after a black widow spider bite. Uh, Priap the question is, what is priapism? Named after the Greek god Priapus, um, he's a god of fertility. It's an extended and painful uh, male erection. So management, what do we do about this? It sounds pretty severe. So most of the time, all you really need is local wound care. So with this, we mean we clean the wound, we dress the wound, update your tetanus status or your tetanus vaccine if you need it. But the big thing is just pain management. So people come in with a lot of pain. This, unfortunately, is one of those pain syndromes that doesn't really respond very well to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or acetaminophen. You kind of have to go big gun painkiller to try to make these people comfortable. Uh, the cases I've personally seen, it looks to like some of the most horrific pain I've ever encountered in the emergency room. Uh, the opioids are generally what we're going to be using for pain relief, and Dr. Vo's lecture last week told us why we shouldn't be using them. This is one case where it is generally warranted. 
And we also use benzodiazepines, so things like midazolam or lorazepam or diazepam to try to treat the, that muscle spasm. And again, luckily, we have an antivenom for this one. Uh, the currently available antivenom is equine or horse-derived. It is rapidly effective and curative. However, we don't use it on everybody for a good reason. There are high rates of allergic reactions because it's made from a horse serum. Uh, so imagine injecting somebody with a horse serum, you can have an allergic reaction to it. So high rates of allergic reactions and anaphylaxis and serum sickness have been reported. It's usually, because of that, reserved for only severe or refractory cases. So when we try to treat with pain medications and muscle relaxants and you're still not able to get any control, that's when we're going to bring out the antivenom. It's kind of a discussion of risks versus benefit. And when we know that almost nobody dies from a black widow spider bite, and we might actually kill somebody giving the antivenom and causing a severe anaphylactic reaction, we have to really reserve it for people who really, really need it. There is a new, better tolerated antivenom, and by better tolerated I mean it's uh, the way that the chemical is split. It's split into a fab fragment, which just means that it has less of a chance to create an allergic reaction. So that it's being studied right now. It is not, however, available yet. Okay, that was the Black Widow. Moving on to the next one. What's this one? All right, nice, all right. So this is the brown recluse. Oh, yeah, that probably gave it away. Um, brown recluse spider, and it's also known as the fiddleback. Um, so it's named for its brown violin-shaped mark on its cephalothorax. So going back to the big picture, if you can imagine this being a violin. Does anybody see it? See it? OK. Took me a while. So that's how it's named. <clears throat> it's a smaller spider, generally 6 to 20 millimeters long. Here's, uh, here's it next to a penny, so you get an idea. It's very prominent in the southeast and southwest uh, United States, but they're found everywhere. They tend to be um, found in uh, cargo trucks, so they, they migrate around that way, hitchhiking. They're very, very resilient spiders. They can last up to six months without any food or water. Uh, so they're, they're, there's a reason why they're still around. And again, the females are more dangerous than the males. So what does it do? The clinical presentation, the envenomation syndrome, we call loxosalism. Um, and it ranges anywhere from a small red bite site to systemic illness. It's kind of a recurring theme here. It kind of depends on how much venom you get and how big you are. Uh, the bite can be initially painless. But generally, within two to eight hours, that bite site develops into a blister and starts bleeding. Then three to four days later, that central blister starts to necrose or die. So here's an image of an early brown recluse bite. So in the center here, you can see that little ulceration, and it's surrounded by this redness and swelling. So that's what it looks like early on. Then it gets way worse. So five to seven days after the bite, a thing called an eschar forms. So it's kind of, imagine kind of a big scab. Um, so here's an example of an eschar filling in the ulcer. So this is your body trying to heal that wound. And then that eschar falls off one to two weeks later, leaving just a giant ulceration. So this is a different patient, but this is what the ulcer looks like after the eschar falls off. So then you just have a large, gaping open wound that takes months to heal. You can also get systemic luxosalism. So children are more susceptible. So this is one of those uh, principles that we had talked about in several of, uh, of the previous lectures. But everything in toxicology is the dose makes the poison. So everything is kind of dependent on a milligram per kilogram basis of how much toxin or venom is there. Because of that, children are far more susceptible to systemic loxosalism. They're a lot smaller, and the spider is so tiny, it doesn't really differentiate between a child and an adult as far as how much venom it's going to give. So the same amount of venom for a much smaller person is going to create bigger problems. So systemic loxosalism generally occurs one to three days after the bite. Symptoms include fevers, chills, vomiting, classically joint pain, and muscle aches. And then when you get to the hospital, we can measure your blood work and things like that. And it can cause muscle breakdown, which we call rhabdomyolysis. It can cause kidney injury, and there have been deaths reported. So what do you do about it? There are a lot of things that have been tried with limited success and almost no success. So what we have is good wound care. That seems to be the best treatment option. 
Uh, studies have been done looking at early surgical correction, so they'll try to cut out the area of skin uh, where you were bitten prior to all of this necrosis and skin death happening. That tends to lead to much worse outcomes because uh, we don't know the margins of how far that toxin has spread in your skin very well. So what ends up happening is we cut out an area of the skin and there's still toxin left in the area we left behind, so you just end up with a bigger, more difficult to manage wound. So what we do now, generally, so you can have corrective or cosmetic surgery months, uh, weeks to months after the bite. So what we're essentially trying to do is just wait to see the furthest extent of how far the skin death is going to occur and then correct it afterwards. Uh, it, this picture here is uh, in, a, in a case of where they tried early surgical correction and it just ends up being a mess. Uh, there's no way to really repair this very well afterwards. So they're just going to have to wait until the extent of the damage is done, excise the whole thing, and skin graft over it. Um, so it ends up being a lot more to do when you try to correct this early. So we tend to wait until after the damage has been done. These ones are kind of fun. Um, so this is the um, red kneed tarantula, very clever name. Tarantulas. There are about 54 species that we know of in the desert southwest here in the US, so they're fairly common. And for whatever reason, they are very popular as pets. The female can live for about 15 to 20 years, which is impressive. Uh, but what, what do we care about tonight? They're defense mechanisms. So they have large fangs associated with a very painful bite. So you can see this cute little furry friend here. That's his head. And these are its gigantic fangs <laughs> on this person's thumb. Um, so for its size, the fangs are pretty massive, um, and it uses it to hunt. So it eats things like mice and squirrels. Uh, so this little tarantula can take down an animal much larger than itself. But the thing that we care about more as toxicologists are actually urticating hairs, which we're going to get into. So here's just a photo example, kind of a close-up of the belly part of a tarantula. And so you see these kind of red-orange hairs coming off. So those are the urticating hairs that we're talking about. And it's important to know that urticating hairs are only present in New World tarantulas, so only the ones we have here in the US. The tarantulas in Europe and in Asia, they don't have these things. So they're particularly dangerous here in the US. Um, so with, uh, from the bite, you get relatively minor effects in humans. Um, the, the toxin doesn't seem to do much to humans, uh, but it does kill small animals because that's what it eats. These urticating hairs, however, what they do is they sort of rub their hind legs together and it actually shoots off the back of the abdomen um, like a projectile. So they shoot these little hairs at people, um, which is kind of fun to watch. You can YouTube videos of this. It's great. Um, but when it strikes your skin, it's recognized as a foreign body. So your body mounts this huge immune response to get rid of this thing. So what do they look like when they come in? So the bites themselves, they can range anywhere from painless, which is less common, to severe pain, which is far more common, lasting for several hours. It's often associated with a fever, and this is likely due to the venom, um, and also associated with itching and redness around the site. But generally, that's all you really get from the bite of a tarantula. So take some ibuprofen, put a cool compress on it, you should be fine. The hairs, however, cause an intense inflammation around the site. And they can also puncture the eye, the globe of the eye. Um, and some of these tarantula species, what they do is they don't just shoot one hair at a time. Uh, they launch a cloud of hair into the air. Um, and if you're a shocked uh, person standing next to the, the spider who just launched a cloud of hair uh, into your face, you might gasp and take a deep breath in. So there's cases of this that have happened. Um, and it causes severe respiratory distress if you inhale these things. So here's just a couple examples. So this is an eyeball that unfortunately met with some urticating hairs. Um, it's hard to see on the photo, but there's little dots all over here. Um, and that's where the hairs struck the eye. And here's an example of a hand that got the urticating hairs. And you can see this inflammatory reaction. So you see the redness and swelling. Um, I've never had it done to me, but it's reported as particularly pruritic or very itchy. So what is the treatment for tarantulas? Supportive care. You're going to hear it time and time again. So cool compresses, pain control. But specifically for the hair. If you have these hairs embedded in the skin, we generally recommend adhesives so like duct tape. Um, put it over, peel the hairs off, and then irrigate the, the area copiously with saline or water. Hairs in the eye, however, 
these uh, duct tape doesn't work so great on an eyeball. So we, uh, we end up calling the ophthalmologist, the eye specialist, in to come and under a microscope pick each hair out. All right, we're wrapping things up now. I think everybody knows that this is a scorpion. So we're gonna talk about scorpions. There's over 650 known species of scorpions. And the, the where they differ from everything else we've talked about tonight is they envenomate by stinging rather than biting. Um, so they, at the end of their tail, there's a thing called the telson. Uh, it's this little bulb area at the end of the tail with a little stinger on it. <clears throat> there's approximately 11,000 to 19,000 exposures in the United States every year. That's a lot. The overwhelming majority of these happen in the desert southwest. Arizona is sort of the big place where this occurs. But the good news is that from the data that we have from 1995 to 2015, there's been one death reported. So there's, we get thousands and thousands and thousands of exposures, but one death in, from 95 to essentially now. And it actually just occurred a couple of years ago in Arizona, um, and it was a three-year-old. So this is the one that we care about the most here in the US. So this is called the bark scorpion, or the Arizona bark scorpion. It's a uh, scientific name. It's in uh, Centroroides exulcata. The venom that it uh, injects it through its stinger has four known neurotoxins. Okay, so we talked about neurotoxins before and what they do, so you can kind of anticipate what the clinical syndrome is gonna look like. The stings produce intense local pain, redness, burning. So here's uh, a leg that got a bark scorpion to it, so you can see that redness area there. This pain and swelling and uh, redness generally progresses to maximum severity in about five hours or so, but the symptoms can last up to 30 hours. Doesn't sound like a fun 30 hours. Other th things that you can present with, so again, systemic symptoms if you have a large burden of venom, elevated blood pressure, elevated heart rate, sweating. People also commonly have vomiting and feel short of breath, but here's where the neurotoxin comes in. You get muscle twitching, muscle spasm, gait imbalance, so difficulty walking, uh, and blurred vision. Uh, and again, the most severe symptoms tend to happen in children. So I just wanted to show you a video of what this actually looks like. Um, it's just pulled off of YouTube, so you can see the whole thing later, but we don't have time to go through everything. Um, so Dr. Leslie Boyer, um, she's another toxicologist down in Arizona. Uh, she was one of the people that got the anti-venom FDA approved here in the US, so she's, she sees a lot of scorpion stings, so this is a, kind of a passion of hers. So let's try to get that video going for you. The Sonoran Desert is home to a number of venomous creatures that can pose problems for people, particularly those living in rural areas. In Arizona, there are 30 species of scorpion and about 8,000 scorpion stings each year. While these stings are painful, most can be managed with basic first aid. But the sting of one species, the Arizona bark scorpion, can be deadly, especially to small children. In Arizona, children who are stung by scorpions will sometimes develop a nerve poisoning syndrome so look at the eyes. that is really frightening. They have a set of symptoms that comes from all of the different nerves of the body being kind of stuck in the on position simultaneously, and all of their muscles lose control so that there may be one twitching and one jerking and a little inhalation and a little exhalation all at the same time. When you put it all together, they don't breathe very well. Dr. Leslie Boyer is an expert on desert creatures. 10 years ago, when she okay. learned that an anti-venom... All right, so the, those sort of roving eye movements that you saw, that's classic for scorpion stings in children. It's called opsoclonus. Uh, so they really lose control of all their muscles, and their eyes just kind of go all cookie monster. Um, and then you saw that sort of writhing on the bed, and it's, again, due to the... Their, they lose control uh, over their nervous system. So it's pretty severe. So what is the treatment? <clears throat> Luckily, the overwhelming majority of envenomations are not severe. So again, local wound care, pain control. And for their systemic symptoms, because most of the victims are adults, um, you can just use these intravenous benzodiazepines like midazolam, lorazepam, or diazepam, and try to control that muscle twitching. For the anti-venom, so it's equine-derived, so again, coming from horses. It was finally FDA approved in 2011, but they had it in Mexico for like 30 years before that. Um, but here is a vial of the antivenom next to the culprit. Um, but it, it is generally reserved for intractable pain or inability to get control of that muscle twitching. 
or for children with neurologic symptoms. So like the kid that you saw in the video definitely is getting antivenom. Okay, that covers the species we're gonna talk about today. So what have we learned? We've learned that the American pit vipers are dangerous, but luckily we have an effective antivenom. Just if this happens to you or a loved one, if you're on a hike or camping, don't try to cut, suck, drain, don't do anything to the wound, just immobilize and get yourself to a hospital. The coral snakes are less dangerous. That's a good news. Bad news, we don't really have easy access to the antivenom anymore, and they do still kill people. So again, immobilize, get yourself to a hospital. There's other things we can do to help support you rather than uh, relying on the antivenom. And the other thing to remember with the coral snakes, red on yellow is bad. You don't need to remind, uh, have a rhyme for it. Red on yellow is bad. <clears throat> uh, also, spiders are terrifying. Um, again, personal opinion. Um, but luckily, you probably won't die from a spider bite. Uh, the treatment for them is largely supportive. Scorpions can make you very sick. Children are far more susceptible. Again, we talk about dose makes the poison. But we do, again, have an effective antivenom for scorpion stings. And then with all this in mind, everything you learned tonight, think about it on your next hike. Hike at your own risk. And with that, just a reminder to everybody, because this is the last talk for the toxicology series. Um, both Dr. Vo and I work at the San Francisco Division of the uh, California Poison Control System. We are open 24-7. Uh, it's a free service. Call us anytime if you have an exposure or even just drug or toxin-related question. We're happy to help. And with that, I'll take questions. Right, so the question is, does it help to put ice on a uh, snake bite? Um, to slow the circulation. So this um, logic would say that, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, it's been tried. A lot of things have been tried with snake bites, including ice packs. Um, and uh, uh, they actually went as far as doing um, electric shock therapy to the extremity to prevent any uh, expansion of, of the venom. Uh, but all of those things have not proven to be beneficial compared to placebo. So compared to doing nothing else, there isn't a benefit. And every time you try to introduce another technique into doing something, or another instrument into doing something, you run the risk of causing more harm. Um, so the question was regarding the aggressive nature of some animals uh, versus others, and snakes tend to only bite in defensive uh, moves um, compared to things like rabid animals and uh, rodents. Um, so yes, I was attacked by several rats in the New York City subway system, um, but uh, they're relatively benign. And if you just kind of shove them off with your foot, they'll run away um, for the most part. But as far as rabies uh, and animals, it is a neurologic condition for uh, animals infected with the rabies virus. Um, it just makes them aggressive. Uh, not always, but that's sort of the characteristic finding. Um, so it, it, they're sort of, the animals that are infected with rabies are not by nature necessarily aggressive. It's another affliction that's causing them to be so. Uh, so it's kind of hard for, for comparison. But you, you are correct, though, that the snakes themselves, for the most part, don't want anything to do with you. Uh, and if, as long as you don't invade their space or step on them or kick them, they probably won't bite you. Uh, the exception to that um, of, of the snakes, and it's still not technically an aggressive animal, but that Mojave rattlesnake that we were discussing before, um, there are a lot of cases of that of you know, hikers just going on a run, and then it like chases people and will bite them. Uh, so it, it, it's technically not considered to be an aggressive species, but of the rattlesnakes, I think it is a little bit more than, let's say, the western diamondback. Um, so the question was regarding tick bites and Lyme disease. Um, so yeah, um, that the reason why I didn't talk about it is it's not technically an envenomation. Um, so Lyme disease uh, in and of itself, it does, got the, the, the uh, affecting agent is within the tick. It's in the Ixodes tick, but um, it's not a venom. It's actually injecting the disease into you. Um, so uh, yeah, I didn't cover it here today, but it is, it, was there a specific question about it? Good question. Um, there are, there, there are people out there um, and they tend to have internet fame uh, that propose that they have bitten, been bitten so many times that they are now immune to various bites and stings from different creatures. There is no evidence to show that that is true, um, 
But uh, I, I guess there isn't much evidence to show that it's not. Um, you know, there's no randomized trial of a bunch of these people and then throwing a bunch of rattlesnakes at them and see what happens. Um, so it's it's really hard to confirm or deny. Uh, but logically, it doesn't make sense that you would develop an immunity because there's so many different components to all the different types of venom that you'd have to be constantly envenomated uh, all the time by a thousand different types of snakes to really be exposed to everything that you're going to get exposed to. So it, I don't think it's possible, but who, who am I to say? Yeah. So the question is, um, are there any long-term effects from uh, these envenomations, uh, or uh, do the symptoms occur just while the venom is physically present? Um, that's a good question. Um, generally, for these envenomation syndromes, you have to have venom present for it to happen. Um, however, you know you could view it as there are long-term effects. Like for example, the brown recluse spider bite. The venom is no longer present after the ashar falls off and you have a giant ulcer on your leg or your arm. But I would consider that to be a fairly long-term effect, especially if you need corrective surgery to fix the problem. So there, there isn't much in the way of data to show recurrence of syndrome in the absence of another envenomation. So it's not like you get bit by a rattlesnake today, have your symptoms that resolve tomorrow, and then a year later, the symptoms come back without being bitten again. Um, so we don't have any data to show that. Um, so I guess the short answer would be no. Right. So the question is, if you have a black widow in your house, what is the best way to um, eradicate your home of the creature? Um, <clears throat> I would say carefully. Uh, so, so, you know, the formal recommendations, I, I would think, from you know, the poison control standpoint would be to call an exterminator um, rather than you yourself get up close and personal with a potentially very venomous uh, uh, spider. Um, just anecdotally, so not official answer, um, my family's home in LA uh, has a lot of black widow spiders that show up uh, in the back. And um, I use a very long broom um, and attack from a distance. Uh, so they're not jumping, no. Yeah, but they, they're actually really fast, so be careful. So yes, the official answer is call an exterminator. Okay, a couple questions. So um, the first question was regarding um, essentially how long do you have to get to a hospital if a child's bitten by a snake? Um, the answer to that would be get there as soon as possible. But yeah, it, most of the time you don't just drop dead after a, a rattlesnake bite. Uh, you do have some time, but the longer you wait, the more antivenom and generally the more severe your envenomation is going to get. So I would to answer your question, yeah, you for the most part should have a couple hours to get to a hospital, but the faster you're there, the easier the management's going to be and increasing the likelihood of not having more severe sequelae, including that skin death and necrosis. Um, and your second question was, can you say it one more time? Um, so the question was regarding if you're bitten by a juvenile snake, they tend to be more dangerous than adult or more mature snakes. Um, again, that is one um, sort of theory that's been passed down a lot with very little to show its if it's true. Um, because uh, again, you know, the way that we measure how much venom is injected um, is from like milking studies. So where we make these antivenoms, you have all of these rattlesnakes and some person who really likes snakes has the job of going and picking them up by the head and putting them on a bottle to have them envenomate um, and we collect their venom. So there are studies looking at the amount and volume of venom from juvenile snakes versus adults. Um, and they're about the same. And most of the time, the juveniles make less venom. But the thought process behind the juveniles being more dangerous is that they're not as experienced and they don't know what to do. Um, and so they might, rather than a mature adult, which would dry bite you, so just as a warning sign to get out of my space, a juvenile would just bite and unload all of its venom. There's not a lot of data to show that that is true. Most of the time, if you get bitten, the I would say the majority of the time, we don't have a snake that gets brought in, like, oh, this is the one that bit me. So we don't know if it's a juvenile. It does happen, though. It, there are lots of case reports of ER visits with a person coming in with either a snake head or a live snake with them. Um, please don't do that. Um, <laughs> but so we, it, I think in theory, it makes sense. Uh, but we just don't have any data to, to say definitively that that is true.
I, so I, so the question is regarding um, newts that uh, secrete tetrodotoxin through their skin. Um, I personally have no experience with that. I've never had a case um, that being said, I have hopefully a long and fruitful career in front of me, but to date I haven't, and as far as I know, none of the colleagues that I've ever worked with have, have had it, but it is in the toxicology literature. So there are newts out there that do secrete this, it's a very, very potent neurotoxin uh, through their skin, um, so in handling them, um, you can be exposed. Um, it's the same, uh, tetrodotoxin is the same toxin that's in, this is another plug to come back for the marine talk, um, in um, uh, uh, pufferfish. So or blowfish. So you hear the, the stories of, you know, don't eat pufferfish or blowfish um, f at a sushi place uh, unless, well, I would say just don't ever do it. But it's really popular, um, and part of it is the danger in it. And um, the livers of these fish contain tetrodotoxin. Um, so the tetrodotoxin uh, is a very potent neurotoxin that causes fairly rapid paralysis. So um, you're paralyzed and you can't breathe and you die. Um, but in very, very small amounts, um, it causes a little what's called perioral paresthesias. So around your mouth starts to tingle. And so it's thought that when you get just the right amount of tetrodotoxin, you get this little rush because you know you're having a poison, um, but it's not going to kill you. I don't think that's a gamble I would recommend anybody takes, um, but it is out there. Um, of note, just since we're on the topic, um, you can, you know, in larger cities in this country go out to a sushi place and get puffer fish or blowfish um, and have it served to you. But those, uh, because of regulations here, um, are grown on farms in the US um, and they do not contain any tetrodotoxin. So it's safer here. But if you go to Japan, watch out. Yeah, so the Gila monster, uh, the question is regarding just uh, toxicity from the Gila monster uh, envenomations. So, um, they're interesting. Uh, I, I excluded them from the talk for time's sake, and it's just so uncommon. Um, but Gila monsters traditionally, much like the Alapids, um, they bite and they do not let go. Um, so those classically, people will go into their emergency room uh, with a Gila monster attached to their arm. Um, because even just trying to pry their jaw off, they're really strong jaws, and you can't get them off of your arm with one hand. Um, so a lot of the case reports have been you actually have to kill the animal to get it off of the arm. Um, so the, as far as just the mechanical trauma of the bite, it's uh, a little bit more severe than our lapid bites. Um, but as far as the toxin goes, it does cause an intense inflammatory reaction at the bite site. There are very few cases reported of people getting systemically ill from it. Um, but it is generally like nausea, vomiting, um, and muscle aches and things like that. Um, but for the most part, the thing that we worry about with the Gila monster is more of just the bite and how to get this thing off your arm. All right, thank you very much.